Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Question one, Alison McInnes. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what factors it considers when designating seal haul-out sites. Minister Aileen MacLeod. In designating seal haul-out sites, the Scottish Government uses a methodology developed by scientists from the Sea Mammal Research Unit at the University of St Andrews. This involves consideration of several factors, including the relative proportion of the regional population of each seal species that regularly use a site, the persistence of the use of a site over time, whether the use of a site is increasing or decreasing over time, and whether or not a particular site is a significant breeding site for grey seals. Thank you. Thank Alison the Minister um, for her answer. Uh, the Minister will, be, will perhaps be aware of the increasingly large seal haul out on the estuary of the River Ithan in my North East region. I know from um, correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Government is discussing with stakeholders and its statutory advisers whether the scientific evidence warrants it being granted designated status prior to the five-year nationwide review. I wonder if the Minister could provide an update on these discussions and what local circumstances are being taken into consideration and when does she expect a decision to be made on whether to give seals on the ISIN protected status? Minister. Can I uh, thank Alison McInnes uh, for her supplementary? I'm aware that she's already written uh, to the Cabinet Secretary back in March about this issue, and this has already had a response from uh, Mr Lockett. Now, the Scottish Government is currently preparing a public consultation on the possible designation of this site, which it hopes to publish uh, in the summer of this year. This site is a relatively new one for grey seals, and it was identified as important too late in the original designation process to be included in the original list of 194 seal haul-out sites designated in September last year. Many thanks. Question two, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to ensure that more people can buy local and eat Scottish produce. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government knows that we have a fantastic range of fine food and drink right on our doorstep in supporting initiatives such as Sourcing for Growth, which links Scottish food producers with manufacturers, Think Local, which provides support to local food companies, and Taste Our Best, which requires 40% of local produce to be used. We are showing our commitment to ensuring that the best of Scotland's food is available and promoted for our people and our visitors from around the world. I thank the Minister for your answer, and I would like to say as a, a, a member of the, representing the North East region, I don't know how much the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Richard Lockett, enjoyed testing the fantastic local produce at the Scottish Seafood Association food store last Friday at the Skipper Expo in Aberdeen. As an active member of the association in previous life, I was delighted to see that the store was a result of a cooperation between the onshore and the offshore fishing sector with the backing of the Scottish Fish Producers Association and of the Book and Brace uh, Coastal Hotel. What I would like from the Minister is, with the upcoming test of Grampian, will the Minister ensure that in the year of food and drink, the successes are replicated throughout Scotland, so that as many people as possible have the opportunity to buy local and eat Scottish fish? Minister. Uh, of course, the Year of Food and Drink offers a wonderful opportunity to promote Scotland's food and drink to our people and our visitors through a dedicated £282,000 in £825 fund. Scotland's natural larder is being showcased throughout 2015 at 47 events the length and breadth of the country. A Taste of Grampian and other events such as Seafest, sea Lossy Mouth and a broad sea festival and Scotland Salmon Festival are being supported through this fund, providing a number of opportunities for people to buy and eat Scottish fish. What I'd also like to highlight to the member is that as part of the year of food and drink, the month of October has the theme of sustainable shores with a focus very much on promoting our fishing, seafood and salmon with sustainability at its core. Thank you very much. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will know that the Cabinet Secretary attended the Fantastic Food and Drink Awards last week. And from South Scotland, there were a number of nominees, including Errington Cheese and Canapé, among these. 
Uh, could I ask, um, in addition to uh, the concerns express, expressed by Nourish and in, indeed by Christian Allard about um, local links and networks, what can the Scottish Government do specifically to support more rural employment and skills development in um, both producer and supplier chains? Thank you. Minister. Well, the government is actually supporting a number of local food projects, uh, such as the Sourcing for Growth, which I mentioned earlier. There's also uh, the Think uh, Local. We have our Taste, and Beth, our Taste Our Beth, which encourages tourism businesses across the country to use fresh seasonal Scottish produce, showcasing a high quality produce to visitors from home and abroad. We also have our market driven supply chain and our food processing cooperation uh, and marketing grant scheme. Uh, as well, which awarded projects, uh, awarded grants to 175 projects worth up to £47 million to assist the construction of buildings and purchase of equipment, market research and product development, and to aid cooperation and collaboration in the food chain. Now, a new capital scheme, uh, a new capital only scheme opened in May with a non capital element opening in the autumn. Now, the new uh, capital only scheme will plough £70 million into food and drink processing in Scotland as part of the new Scottish Road Development Programme. And our £47 million investment that levered in £114 million private sector funding and safeguarded or created about 8,500 jobs. And of course, all of that is being fed back into the local economy. Excellent. Many thanks. Question three, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask uh, the Scottish Government what steps it can take to reduce the use of barbed wire in the vicinity of cattle in order to protect the quality of hides for leather production. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government considers the measures to protect the quality of hides a commercial matter between the leather industry and its suppliers, and we would encourage uh, tanneries, abattoirs and farmers to agree and apply their own standards. Thank you very much. John Mason. Uh, I thank the Minister. She may be aware that Andrew Muirhead is one of the world's leading producers of uh, leather and are based in my constituency, and they produce leather for the likes of aircraft uh, seats. But they and UK Leather Federation have told me that uh, across the EU they reckon some 800 million uh, euros is lost uh, each year because of damaged hide. And yet in some countries in Germany only 6% of hides were damaged, whereas in the UK it was 70 to 90%. So is there no way that the government could do something to help the industry? Minister. Uh, the member raises an important issue on behalf of his constituent and certainly uh, the Scottish Government would urge uh, Andrew Muirhead and Sons and other uh, leather manufacturers to discuss this important issue with the National Farmers Union of Scotland in the first instance. I'm aware that other countries such as Ireland have had some success replacing uh, barbed wire with electric fences incentivised by market demand for high quality uh, hides. I think if the member would like any sort of further and more detailed uh, information, I would certainly recommend it may be helpful for him to also write directly to the Cabinet Secretary. Many thanks. Uh, question for Ian Gray. Mm. To ask the Scottish Government what support it plans to provide to farmers' markets. Uh, in 2012, the Scottish Government announced £2.5 million support for the Think Local initiative to be delivered over three years. The initiative, which runs until the end of this financial year, provides targeted support to local food producers and suppliers, including farmers' markets, local food retail and local food events. Now, as part of the Think Local, the Community Food Fund allows food and drink producer groups, uh, networks and community organisations to apply for up to £25,000 to establish farmers' markets that celebrate and promote food and drink throughout the year. The Scottish Government has also pledged over £4 million to support food education in 2010 to 2016. And this will ensure that pupils understand about the food journey from plough to plate and is supporting the Royal Highland Education Trust to facilitate pupil farm visits and farmer markets in schools. It, it thanks to the Minister for her reply. Haddington Farmers Market, uh, is a, in my constituency, is a well-established farmers market indeed. It has been providing a great outlet for local produce for around 15 years, from Falco German bread to Belhaven smoked trout, black and gold oils, and fantasy farm uh, vegetables. But it does have to constantly keep up and refresh its promotional and development activities to grow and thrive. Uh, I appreciate the grants which the Minister referred to for uh, starting up farmers' markets, but can she indicate what specific support an established market like Haddington might be able to access from Scottish Government funds? 
Minister. Well, I think as I already said in my original answer, there is also there is a Think Local uh, fund which has got £2.2 .2 million to help champion local food, particularly around adding value and supporting SMEs and using the Community Food Fund to promote food tourism and the farmers' markets. I think Harrington uh, Farmers' Market is to be commended. What I will say to the members is that the Scottish Government refreshed its national food and drink policy in order for food to be a key part of what makes the people of Scotland proud of their country in terms of food that's tasty to eat, nutritious, environmentally sustainable and available to all. And of course, one priority area uh, under this work of becoming a good food nation is to support the local food movement and in particular its socio-economic contribution to Scotland. Now, we believe that Scotland's larder has a lot to offer and that access to Scottish food should be an integral part of our lives. And as such, we are in the process of reviewing the local food initiatives to date and we will consider how best to continue to support promoting local food from 2016 onwards. Thanks. Question five, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects to report on the outcome of its consultation on the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board. Minister. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary plans to issue a report on the consultation of the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board by the 30th of September this year. Thank you. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. Given that the legislation governing the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board specifies the need for periodic reviews to ensure that it is delivering appropriate minimum rates of pay and other condition of services for agricultural workers, why is the Scottish Government consulting on the potential abolition of the board at all? Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is asking whether the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board should continue as it does now, be retained as an advisory body or be removed so that arrangements for agricultural workers are determined under the general employment, uh, employment law. Now, the functions uh, of uh, non-departmental public bodies, which is what the Agricultural uh, Wages Board is, are normally reviewed periodically. And the last review involving uh, the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board was concluded in 2008. The current review was announced as part of the Scottish Government's uh, 2011 uh, Agricultural Manifesto, and this made a commitment to review the function of the Scottish Agricultural uh, Wages Board during the current Parliament. Thank you very much. Question six, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with the Fishing for Litter project. Sir. The Scottish Government has provided support and funding for the duration of the Chemo Fishing for Litter Scotland project that recently celebrated its 10-year anniversary. There are now 15 Scottish harbours participating and to date the project has removed over 800 tonnes of litter from our marine environment. The terms. I thank the Minister for her reply. It is extremely encouraging to see such a large number of boats and harbours participating in the Scottish scheme. However, there are other players in the North Sea who must play their part. What discussions has the Scottish Government had with offshore wind farm developers to ensure they sign up to the Fishing for Litter initiative, considering the Fife coastline has a potential for hundreds of offshore wind farms? Minister. <clears throat> Uh, the Scottish Government has not discussed fishing for litter support directly with offshore wind farm developers, but Marine Scotland uh, provides financial support to uh, Chemo's Fishing for Litter project. Now, the Fishing for Litter Scotland uh, project continues to raise awareness of the significant detrimental impact of marine litter uh, with and to seek to additional funding from marine industries and society in general. Now, sea Green Wind Energy Limited and Beatrice Offshore Wind Farms Limited currently fund the Chemo in Fishing for Litter project and I am pleased that the Scottish Government and other funders have been able to continue financial support for Chemo's work in coordinating and promoting this important initiative. McGregor. Thank you. I too commend the many Scottish fishermen uh, who have helped collect the 800 tonnes of litter. Is the Minister committed to funding the scheme for the next five years and can she provide information on how much of the waste landed is actually recycled? Minister. Uh, what I can say to the members is that Marine Scotland has funded the project for 10 years, including a £40,000 uh, contribution in 2015-16. On the second part of his question, which is rather detailed, uh, I would say to the member if he would wish to have a more detailed response, it would be better if you actually write to the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm sure that we'll make sure that you are supplied with as full a response as possible. Chris Yalar, briefly. 
Thank you, uh, President Officer. I just wanted to point out to the Minister that I did uh, meet Kimo last week and I did write to the companies uh, that are sponsoring, uh, uh, funding Kimo just now. Two of them are from Renewable Your Energy is? and one is from Oil and Gas. So I wonder if the Minister would like to do the same thing and write to Oil and Gas UK and different companies to see if we could help. Thank you, Minister. I'd be more than happy to speak to the Cabinet Secretary and ensure that we do take, take that forward. Any thanks? Qu question seven, David Stewart. <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the take-up has been for the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme. Minister. Uh, there are currently, as of uh, Monday the 1st of June, uh, 386 uh, draft uh, Agri-Environmental Climate Scheme applications and 45 submitted uh, Agri-Environmental Climate Change um, Scheme applications. Mr. Stewart. Uh, President Officer, the Minister will be well aware that Alan Bowie, the President of NFU Scotland, has raised concerns about the take-up of the scheme because of two factors, the complex online application scheme and the overlap with the basic payment scheme. I appreciate the deadline for the basic payment scheme was extended to the 15th of June, uh, but would the Minister listen to the pleas from farmers and crofters and extend the AECS deadline beyond the 12th of June, even at this 11th hour? Minister? Uh, an extension to the application window uh, will put our ability to meet the deadlines for approving and issuing contracts in jeopardy as well as potentially impacting on the work that Rural Payments and Inspections Division are doing to ensure that Pillar 1 payments uh, go out as early as possible. Now, we will keep the situation under review, but any shift in that deadline would have serious repercussions for the rest of the CEP delivery. Now, we anticipate that most of the draft applications will be submitted uh, by the deadline on the 12th of June. But one thing we have said is that we will allow supporting documentation, such as a farm environment assessment, to be submitted up until the 30th of June. Many thanks. Question 8, Stuart Stevenson. The Futures programme is on track to receive all single application forms for rural payments and services by the 15th of June 2015. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is working hard in this transition year to implement the very complex uh, common agricultural policy. As of uh, this morning, 3rd of June, a total of 12,389 single application forms have been received. 7,675 have been received online through our new online system, uh, Rural Payments and Services, and 4,714 received on paper. With two weeks to go to the close of the extended application window, we have received just over half of the expected applications. The rate of submission remains ahead of the comparable point in 2014 when we received 67% of all uh, single application forms in the final two weeks. And as such, we are on track to receive the estimated 22,000 single application forms by the closing date of the 15th of June. We will, however, continue to monitor the situation very closely. Many thanks. Alex Ferguson. Stuart uh, Hamilton, sorry. Uh, I thank the Minister for the encouraging news that we're ahead of progress uh, last year. Uh, being parochial, can the Minister tell us what the response has been in the north-east of Scotland and what the area is likely to benefit from significant funding? Minister. As of the 2nd of June, uh, ARPID has received 1,842 single application forms from the North East Business, or 19% of the total received. And this is about half of the total anticipated, with around two weeks of the application window remaining. With regard to funding, the latest analysis indicates the North East of Scotland will account for about €94 million Euros of the direct payment budget, or £68 million at current exchange rate at the end of the transition period. That's the highest share of any of Scotland's regions. For the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme, the region accounts for 19% of applications currently in the system, the highest total after the southeast of Scotland at 20%. Thanks. Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you. With respect to the Minister, the late rush of last year's application forms was using a system that was easy to understand and user-friendly, as we heard on the Rural Affairs Committee this morning. This one is anything but. On the 24th of March, I asked the Cabinet Secretary whether he would be prepared to issue pre-populated paper forms to Scotland's farmers if it became necessary to do so. His answer was somewhat non-committal. I now understand that various agents and others were advised just on Monday that pre-populated forms are now available at Department offices around the country.
Can the Minister confirm that this is the case? How will the Scottish Government make that information known to Scotland's farming population at large? And with just two weeks to go before the final deadline, why has it taken so long to put this in place when these forms have been sitting in department offices for weeks? Minister. Well, of course, our top priority is to ensure that the new system works well, enabling the cap payments to be made in time to farmers and crofters you know, across Scotland. The very fact that we extended the deadline by one month to the 15th of June to allow customers to get used to the system and new rules of the cap, which is in line with the flexibility that's been offered by the EU, will continue to urge our farmers and crofters not to delay registering for rural payments and services and submitting their single application form as soon as it is finalised. We have, obviously, we do have a much more complex policy this year as well as the new online system. And we're very happy uh, to come back to the detail of the question that was raised by the member uh, in a response from the Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Mark, Sarah, by, very briefly. Yeah, I just want to echo the concern that was raised at the Rural Affairs Committee this morning. The scheme was de described as appalling, a nightmare to operate, and there's clear worry amongst our farmers and our crofters about their ability to finish the forms properly. So please, will the Minister look at the official report and address the issue of a telephone hotline, better consistent guidance, um, and really get the advice out there to enable the thousands of farmers and crofters who have yet to submit? Minister. And we're very happy to also be looking at the official report from the Iraqi Affairs uh, Committee this morning, as I'm aware that the Iraqi Committee was taking evidence around the implementation of the cap. You know, if uh, farmers and crofters are needing help with their single application form or they're encountering any issues, then support is available from the RPED local area offices where blank paper forms continue to be available on request. And where necessary, pre-populated paper forms can also be uh, made available. We are still aiming to be ready for payments to start from December as planned. And Many thanks. And we now move to portfolio questions to the Justice and Law Officers. Question one, Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the effectiveness of fiscal work orders. Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the use of uh, fiscal work orders, orders was piloted in seven local authority areas. An evaluation of the four initial pilot sites published in December 2010 found them to be fair, efficient and effective. The evaluation was also found that uh, fiscal work orders filled a gap in the criminal justice system by providing an alternative for those offenders for whom a fine was either not the most appropriate or effective disposal. As a result of these successful pilots and in response to a specific recommendation from the Angelini Commission on Women Offenders, fiscal work orders were rolled out across Scotland from 1 April 2015. A national implementation group consisting of representatives from a range of organisations involved in the oversight and delivery of fiscal work orders has been established to oversee the national rollout. This group will have a key role to play in assessing the impact and effectiveness of these orders as numbers increase over time. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, reply. Um, is the Scottish Government undertaking monitoring of fiscal work orders to ensure demand does not exceed capacity in each community justice authority area? And if it does, is there a provision for the Scottish Government to provide a financial uplift to CJAs to allow them to meet demand? Minister. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Well, as it stands at the present moment, we have provided community justice authorities with an extra half a million pounds uh, in this financial year in order to assist in supporting the rollout of national rollout of uh, fiscal uh, work orders. And that's a matter which has already been taken forward with the local CGAs. Um, uh, in relation to uh, the work that we're also undertaking to monitor this matter, we've asked them um, all local authorities to provide us with bi-monthly uh, monitoring information on the operational delivery of fiscal work orders in their area uh, between the months of June and December. This information will include the number uh, and any additional resources uh, that may be required in relation to the delivery of fiscal work orders. The monitoring of that information uh, will then be taken forward by the uh, National Implementation Body and if there are any further funding issues or um, other issues which are identified as part of that monitoring exercise, then we have already given a commitment that we will consider these as we move forward. Many thanks. Question 2, Dr Elaine Murray. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what is, its response is to the recent Audit Scotland report, which estimates that there may be a 42.7 million gap in the funding of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in 2019-20. Sir Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the challenge of bringing together eight legacy fire services represented one of the biggest public sector reforms in a generation. In its recent positive report, Audit Scotland confirms that the fire reform process has been a huge success. In its report, Audit Scotland said, and I quote, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service managed the 2013 merger of the eight fire and rescue services effectively, and the merger followed good practice. The Auditor General for Scotland also said, this achievement provides a valuable opportunity to share the lessons of how this was done with other public bodies going through a merger process. Audit Scotland singled out the specially effective local engagement with the communities throughout the reform process, which has had no adverse impact on the public, and that the creation of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has allowed the performance of the service to improve over time. Thank you, Dr Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The policy aims of the Police and Fire Reform Act were to protect and improve local services while not cutting frontline services. However, the Chief Officer of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Alistair Hay, stated in evidence to the Public Audit Committee on the 27th of May that there had already been a reduction from approximately 4,000 whole-time firefighters to 3,850 since the creation of the single service, and that if SFRS is to take the amount of money indicated in the Audit Scotland report out of the budget, SFRS would have to look at a further reduction in the number of whole-time firefighters across Scotland. Does the Minister have any plans to avert that possibility? And does he believe that there should be a minimum number of whole-time firefighters in Scotland as there are for police officers? Minister. Well, certainly, uh, in my original answer, I, mean, I, I recognise the challenge that uh, SFRS have had to go through in terms of implementing fire uh, rescue service reform. Um, what I'm celebrating in the first, first answer is the fact that it has been done largely successfully and without any adverse impact on the public, which I'm sure uh, Dr Murray would be, would be uh, pleased to hear. Um, but we do recognise that there's a challenge going forward. We have to address, as I'm sure that the member is aware, issues with uh, VAT, which we were all aware of at the time of the Police and Fire Reform Act, but also we had been objecting to the UK Government position in this and continue to do so. And there are also other impositions in terms of the impact on employer national insurance contributions or the changes in single-tier pension, which is impacting on uh, the Fire and Rescue Service as well. So there are a number of uh, external budget pressures which the Fire and Rescue Service are having to cope with. But I think it's important to stress to date there have been no compulsory redundancies. We have no station closures in Scotland. Uh, contrast that with a position in England where Fire and Rescue Service reform has not been implemented. And across England and Wales, 39 station closures and uh, 4,700 firefighters lost. So I think we need to see this in the context. The service is doing uh, the best it can to cope with uh, budget pressures and will continue to deliver a good quality service to the public, and there has been no adverse impact on, on the public safety so far. Thank you. Uh, before I call Roderick Campbell, brief questions and answers will be welcome. Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with the comments made by HM Chief Inspector of Fire and Rescue, Stephen Torrey, when he said that Scotland would have been in a far, far worse situation without reform? Minister. Well, I think, I think Rod Campbell uh, is losing the point I just mentioned in relation to Dr Murray. Absolutely correct. Uh, I agree with Mr Torrey's further comments in which he said the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has done a pretty remarkable job of bringing in reform, maintaining business as usual and making progress. And it is impressive to see how SFRS have coped, as I say, with the responding to budget pressures caused by steep uh, cuts to, to Scotland's block grant and achieving reform savings in each of the, the years since it was created. And as I reiterate the point about the contrast with what's happening in England with 4,700 firefighters being lost and station closures across England and Wales. Uh, we are, should be grateful we haven't had to receive that so far in Scotland. Thank you. Hugh Henry, briefly. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Minister failed to answer the two very specific questions which Elaine Murray asked him, and I hope that he will reflect on that and revert to her in writing. Um, but he mentioned VAT liability, and that was a problem wholly created by the Scottish Government's failure to take the advice that was given to them by the Treasury. But notwithstanding, um, the Minister will have our support in hoping that the UK Government will now move to bail out the Scottish Government for the mess that it created. Minister. Mr Henry appears to have a short memory. His own party voted for the, the very act that brought in single fire and rescue service in Scotland. So I think it's a bit rich for Mr Henry now to, to claim uh, that he has some distance between that decision and now. But I do welcome his support for tackling the VAT issue with the UK Government. I think that is something we hopefully can have common cause on. And I look forward to working with uh, Dr Murray and Mr Henry on, on tackling that, as with the, obviously the, the Cabinet Secretary will in relation to Police Scotland. 
Well, I will say, and uh, apologies to Dr Murray for missing out the, the point about the, uh, the, the establishment number that she, she's looking for an answer on. I will come back to Dr Murray on that point in more detail, bringing in mind the presiding officer's comments. Excellent. Alex Riley, question three. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that there is an adequate joined-up approach to tackling antisocial behaviour. Minister. Um, the answer to Mr Riley is yes. Um, we do believe we have a national strategy in place which is based on prevention, early intervention and diversionary activities. And this is having a positive impact in communities across Scotland, including in the members' own constituency, where school-based police officers undertake diversionary work to ensure young people are guided away from antisocial behaviour. We are making progress, and last year antisocial behaviour reported by members of the public decreased uh, by almost 14% in Scotland as a whole, and partnership working has been central to achieving this reduction, and I've been particularly impressed with the partnerships developed between Police Scotland and communities across the country, which have been identifying areas of concern to allow the deployment of appropriate resources to proactively prevent antisocial behaviour. Alec Riley. The Minister for, for his response, I suppose it depends on how you define antisocial behaviour, but my concern is that too many of my constituents have reported to me the difficulty and getting the police to be able to respond. And I'm told that the, the, the cow and beef constituency is now covered by the Dunfermline district and you could basically have a police officer in Kincardine being called out for antisocial behaviour in Cow and Beath and the very journey itself to get there and, and often police not come in, in numbers because and there's not enough is? numbers there. Is he satisfied that Police Scotland are continuing to do the excellent job that was done previously by the police force in Fife in tackling antisocial behaviour? Minister. Well, I, I know that um, I, I would take the matter very seriously that Mr Rowley mentions, and I'll, I'll happily look into the issue he raises in relation to his own constituents. But I would say, in, in general, we know that across Scotland, and indeed in Fife, I know work is advancing this in developing local ward-level plans for policing based on local priorities, how to tackle particular issues that have been flagged up. I've uh, dealt with that in relation to Claire Baker, had a, a, a query in relation to quad bike thefts and, and antisocial behaviour in relation to quad bikes. So, uh, I think that is a useful approach that's being deployed at local level, but I'm happy to look at the, the matters. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary and myself look at the issue that you raise in relation to uh, problems in Cowdenbeath. Margaret Mitchell, briefly, please. Uh, given the incidents of not just antisocial behaviour, but also criminal offences, such as vandalism, dishonesty and violence involving children under the age of 10, does the, the cabinet, does the minister consider that parenting orders have the potential to make a positive impact in tackling this issue? And can he indicate how many of these um, orders have been issued in Scotland to date? Yes, um, I, apologies, presiding officer. I don't have the answer to the specific question that Margaret Mitchell raised, but we can happily come back in correspondence about the number of parenting orders. But I do certainly recognise the importance of involving families in. in ensuring that we, we have an understanding of the, the issues that relate to, to children and their welfare and making sure that they have enough uh, diversionary positive activities to keep them out of harm's way and keep them away from those individuals that may wish to distract them into crime. So certainly uh, diversion of people away from crime is a very important plank of, of the government's activity in relation to keeping children safe and reducing crime at a local level. Question four, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how the cashback for community scheme has contributed to supporting sport and physical activity opportunities for young people in the Glasgow region. Permanent Secretary Michael Matheson. We are rightly proud of our unique cashback for communities programme. Up to the end of March 2014, Glasgow's young people and their communities have directly benefited from over £5.3 million of cashback investment. Over 160,000 activities and opportunities have helped to develop important life skills through a wide range of sporting, cultural, youth work and youth employability schemes. Uh, Glasgow continues to benefit under phase three of the cashback funding. Uh, given the extensive range of different programmes being delivered in Glasgow, I'd be more than happy to write to the member uh, with details of them rather than trying to list them here this afternoon. Excellent. Much appreciated, Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I look forward uh, to, to the list. Communities that suffer from significant crime often also have significant levels of deprivation, which can make access to sport and physical activity opportunities more challenging and less affordable. These communities also have significant health inequalities, an issue that is a key cross-government priority. Will the Cabinet Secretary therefore consider working with ministerial colleagues to refocus a larger share of future proceeds of crime cash in such communities, areas such as Springburn, Royston and Postle Park, which could benefit my constituents that I represent. OK, 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the member raises a very uh, valid point. Uh, all cash back uh, projects are required under the terms of their grant to focus activity in deprived areas of need using the uh, communities identified through the Scottish Index of Multiple uh, Deprivation. Um, as the member may be aware, uh, projects uh, which are being funded through the proceeds of crime arrangements at the present moment uh, have their funding and provisions uh, committed through until the end of March 2000. In 17. Uh, phase four of the cashback programme will commence in April 2017, and decisions will obviously be taken near the time uh, to focus on that particular tranche. But I certainly think the point which the member has been made is a valid point uh, that we should give further consideration to. And I can assure the member that that will be part of our thinking on how we can further improve the operation of cashback. Thank you so much. Question five, Hugh Henry. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how Police Scotland is held to account and on what occasions Scottish Ministers have intervened in relation to policy issues. Secretary. The Police and Fire Reform Act 2012 establishes the role of the Scottish Police Authority in holding the Chief Constable to account for the policing of Scotland. Scrutiny of policing in Scotland has never been higher. The Scottish Police Authority, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland, Audit Scotland, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner and 32 local authority scrutiny boards all have a key role. This Parliament also plays an important role and we have seen this effectively undertaken over the last two years. Scottish Ministers determine the strategic priorities for the policing of Scotland and ensure that these are delivered alongside with key commitments within the programme for government. It is appropriate that a strong relationship between Police Scotland, the SPA and the Scottish Government is maintained. In order to support this, a framework of strategic engagement is in place which sets out how we engage on policing issues and, in turn, how we can ensure effective decisions are being made. Hugh, Hugh Henry. Officer, I didn't hear in that response any specific uh, answers about the occasions in which ministers have intervened, and I'd be interested um, to know when uh, Scottish ministers have met with the Chief Constable to discuss policy issues, either on a, a formal basis or an informal basis. But the minister, I think, is living in his own little world uh, when he says that scrutiny has never been more effective. Um, so the SPA has singularly fa failed to hold Police Scotland to account. Armed police stop and search are just two of the examples. And if the SPA are failing, why then, why then is the Scottish Government sitting back and allowing that to happen? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so officer, I meet with the Chief Constable um, uh, on a very regular basis each month to discuss a whole range of issues around uh, policing, and that's a matter for uh, public record where we will consider issues that are a matter of concern. I must confess, I do think that Hugh Henry does live in some sort of strange parallel universe to think that prior to the introduction of the Scottish Police Authority, that in some way the eight forces we had across Scotland that were under detailed scrutiny. The facts of the matter were that they were not under any great detailed scrutiny. Policing is now under greater level of scrutiny now than it has ever been. That is not to say that it is perfect, but it is under much greater level of uh, scrutiny. For example, on the issue of armed, uh, uh, armed fire officers, uh, that is a matter that was investigated by a matter that was investigated by HMICS. They made a range of recommendations which have been taken forward by Police Scotland, as is the case with the SPA in their investigation into it. And when he says that we sit back and do nothing in these matters, on the issue of stop and search, it's this government that set up the independent group under John Scott to look at that very issue in order to address the concerns that have been raised. So I think if there's anybody living in a strange, bizarre wee world, it's certainly Hugh Henry. Many thanks. Question six, Willie Colfey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the justice system supports families of victims of fatal accidents. Thanks. Solicitor General Leslie Thompson. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service recognise that nearest relatives in cases where a loved one has died require support and information about the circumstances surrounding the death. The Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit is a team of dedicated specialists in COPFS who carry out investigations into reported deaths and who liaise with the nearest relatives to provide information. I, however, recognise that more needs to be done to explain to families what communication they can expect from COPFS. 
Last week, I advised Justice Committee members that I had requested that COPFS prepare a milestone charter for this purpose. This charter will outline what families can expect from COPFS in terms of the timing of investigations and our decision making. It will set out clearly how and when we will communicate with families, outlining the key milestones in the investigation and when information will be provided to them. Thank Willie Coffey. Thank the Solicitor General for that answer. She will be aware of the case of my constituent, Alison Hume, who died in the Goldstone Mineshaft accident in 2008. But since then, the family has had little or no support from any formal agency to help them cope, get answers to the many questions and to find closure. Would the Solicitor General give further consideration as to how best to provide support for families of victims of fatal accidents, either by extending the scope of organisations like Victim Support or by supporting local organisations like Halo and Ayrshire, who do provide this type of support free of charge? Mr. General. As I indicated in my earlier answer, I'm committed to improving the communication around information and decision making by use of the new milestone charter. Through the Victim Information and Advice Service, which includes an officer dedicated to work within the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit, we can assist families by providing them with information, not just about our work, but by referring them to third sector support organisations who can support them through the trauma of their loss. As well as victim support, there's a number of organisations such as BREAK and SCID, which provide valuable focus support to families in certain circumstances, such as homicides and road traffic deaths. I do recognise, however, there may be no single organisation which aims to provide comprehensive emotional and psychological support in all cases where someone dies suddenly and unexpectedly. I'm sorry that the family of Ms Hume have suffered such a lack of support since her death and if it would assist, I'd be happy to meet with them, to hear of their experience and their concerns, to discuss where the potential gaps are and to listen to what they think needs to be put in place to help other families dealing with such a loss. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13313 in the name of Liz Smith and Scotland's universities.